Chapter 29 On board a ship to Trebizon, the Black Sea was calm, too calm. The wind blew on slightly and for hours on end, one could only contemplate the same piece of coast, the same rock or the same Anatolian copse. It would have been wrong of me to complain. I needed some peace and quiet given the arduous task that I had to accomplish, to memorize the whole book of Persian-French dialogue written by Monsieur Nicolas, Khayyam's translator. I had resolved to speak to my hosts in their own language. I was not unaware of the fact that in Persia, as in Turkey, many of the intellectuals, the merchants, and the high officials spoke French. Some even knew English. However, if one wanted to move outside the restricted circle of the palaces and the legations, and travel outside the main cities or in their city districts, it had to be done in Persian. The challenge stimulated and amused me. I delighted in discovering affinities with my own language as well as with various Romance languages. Father, mother, brother, daughter in Persian were Pedar, Madar, Bradar, and Doktar. And the common Indo-European roots can hardly be better illustrated. Even in naming God, the Muslims of Persia say Khoda, a term much closer to the English God or the German Gott than to Allah. In spite of this example, the predominant influence is that of Arabic, which is exercised in a curious way. Many Persian words can be replaced arbitrarily by their Arabic equivalent. It is even a form of cultural snobbery, much appreciated by intellectuals, to, to pepper their speech with terms or with whole phrases in Arabic, a practice of which Jamal al-Din was particularly fond. I resolved myself to apply myself to Arabic later, before the moment I had enough on my plate trying to understand Monsieur Nicolas' texts, which, apart from my knowledge of Persian, was providing me with useful information about the country. It was full of conversations such as, which products could one export from Persia? Shawls from Kirman, fine pearls, turquoise, Carpets, tobacco from Shiraz, silks from Mazandaran, leeches and cherry wood pipes. When traveling, should a cook be taken along? Yes, in Persia one cannot move without a cook, a bed, carpets and servants. What foreign coins are used in Persia? Russian imperials, Dutch carbovans and ducats, English and French coins are very rare. What is the current king called? Nasr al-Din Shah. It is said that he is an excellent king. Yes, he is extremely benevolent to, benevolent to foreigners and extremely generous. He is highly educated with a knowledge of history, geography, and drawing. He speaks French and is fluent in the Oriental languages, Arabic, Turkish, and Persian. Once at Trebizond, I took a room in the Hotel d'Italie, the only hotel in town which was comfortable if one could but forget the swarms of flies which transformed every meal into an uninterrupted and exasperating gesticulation. I resigned myself to imitating the other visitors by employing for a few meager coins a young adolescent whose job was to fan me and keep the insects away. The most difficult thing was convincing him to get them away from my table without squashing them before my eyes, in between the dolmas and the kebabs. He obeyed me for some time, but as soon as he, w he saw a fly within reach of his fearsome instrument, the temptation was too great and he would swat. On the fourth day, I found a place on board a freight steamer running the Marseille constantinople Trebizond line. It took me as far as Batum, the Russian port in the east of the, Balk of the Black Sea, where I took the Transcaucasian railway to Baku on the Caspian Sea. The Persian consul there received me so warmly that I hesitated to show him Jamal al-Din's letter. Would it not be better to remain an anonymous traveler and not arouse any suspicions? However, I was beset by some scruples. Perhaps the letter contained a message concerning something other than myself, and I therefore did not have the right to keep it to myself. Abruptly, I thus resolved to say, in an enigmatic way, We have, perhaps, a friend in common. I took out the envelope. The consul opened it carefully. 
He had taken his gold-rimmed glasses from his desk and was reading when I suddenly noticed that his fingers were trembling. He stood up, went over to lock the door to the room, placed his lips to the paper and remained so for a few seconds as if in contemplation. Then he came over to me and held me as if I were a brother who had survived a shipwreck. As soon as he had managed to recompose his expression, he called his servants and ordered them to fetch my trunk to show me to the best room and prepare a feast for the evening. He kept me there for two days, neglecting all his work in order to stay with me and question me ceaselessly about the master, his health, his mood, and particularly what he was saying about the situation in Persia. When it was time for me to leave, he rented a cabin for me on a steamer of the Russian Caucasus Mercure line. Then he entrusted me with his coachman to whom he gave the task of accompanying me to Kazvin and to stay at my side as long as I had need of his services. The coachman immediately proved to be extremely resourceful and often irreplaceable. It was not I who would have to know how to slip some coins into the hand of that proudly mustached customs officer so that he would deign to leave his caviar pipe for a moment to come and inspect my huge Walsley. It was the coachman again who negotiated with the roads administration for the immediate provision of a four-horse carriage, although the official was imperiously inviting us to come back the next day and a seedy innkeeper, who was most apparently his accomplice, was offering us his services. I consoled myself for all these difficulties of the route by thinking of the suffering of the travelers who had preceded me. Thirteen years earlier, the only way to Persia had been the old caravan route which started at Trebizond and led toward Tabriz through Erzurum, with its forty staging points taking six exhausting and expensive weeks, and which was sometimes truly dangerous owing to the incessant tribal warfare. The Transcaucasian had revolution revolutionized matters. It had opened Persia to the world and one could reach that empire with neither risk nor major discomfort by taking a steamer from Baku to the port of Anzali. Then it only took one more week on a road suitable for motor vehicles to reach Tehran. In the West, the cannon is an instrument for war or ceremonial occasions. In Persia, it is also an instrument of torture. If I speak of it, it is because I was confronted by the spectacle, spectacle of a cannon which served the most horrific purpose as I reached the town, the town limits of Tehran. A man who was tied and whose head was the only part of him visible had been placed in the large barrel. He had to stay there under the sun and without food or water until death came to him. Even then, I was told, the custom was to leave his body exposed for a long time in order to make the punishment an example, to inspire silence and dread in all those who passed through the city gates. Was it because of this first image that the capital of Persia exerted such little magic on me? In the cities of the Orient, one always looks for the colors of the present and the shades of the past. In Tehran, I came up against none of that. What did I see there? Thoroughfares which were too wide, linking the rich of the northern districts to the poor of the southern districts. A bazaar absolutely swarming with camels, mules, and gaudy materials, but which could, be, which could hardly bear a comparison with the souks of Cairo, Constantinople, Isfahan, or Tabriz. And wherever one's gaze alighted, there were innum innumerable gray buildings. It was too new. Tehran had too short a history. For a long time, it had only been an obscure dependency of Rai, the prestigious city of the scholars which was demolished at the time of the Mongols. It was not until the end of the 18th century that a Turkoman tribe, the Qajars, took possession of the area. Having succeeded in subduing the whole of Persia by the sword, the dynasty elevated its modest abode to the rank of capital. Until then, the political center of the country had been in the south, at Isfahan, Kirman, or Shiraz. 
That is to say that the inhabitants of these cities had nothing good to say about the brutish northerners who governed them and whose lack of knowledge included, included even that of their language. The reigning Shah, upon his accession to power, needed an interpreter to address his subjects. Anyway, it seems that after, he, after that he acquired a better knowledge of Persia. It must be pointed out that he had plenty of time to do so. When I arrived in Tehran in April 1896, the monarch was preparing to celebrate his jubilee, his 50th year in power. In honor of this, the city was decked with the national emblem bearing the sign of the lion and the sun. Notables had come from all the provinces, numerous foreign delegations had turned up, and even though most of the official guests were lodged in villas, the two hotels for Europeans, the, Al the Albert and the Prevo, were unusually full. It was in the latter named hotel that I finally found a room. It was, I had thought of going straight to Faisal to deliver the letter to him and ask him how I could find Mirza Reza, but I was able to overcome my impatience. Not being unaware of the customs of Orientals, I knew that Jamal din's disciples would invite me to stay with him. I did not want to offend him by refusing, but nor did I want to take the risk of being caught up in his political activity, and still less in that of his master. I therefore checked into the Hotel Prevo, which was run by a Swiss man from Geneva. In the morning, I rented an old mare so that I could go to the American legation, a, practice, a practical act of courtesy on the Boulevard des Ambassadeurs. Then I went to see Jamal din's favorite disciple, with his slender mustache, his long white tunic, the majestic way he held his head and a hint of coldness. Faisal corresponded on the whole to the image which the exile in Constantinople had drawn from me. We were going to become best friends in the world, but the contact was distant and his direct language disturbed and upset me. Such as, such as when we spoke of Mirza Reza. I will do what I can to help you, but I do not wish to have anything to do with that madman. The master told me that he is a living martyr. I replied, then it would be better if he were to die. Do not look at me like that. I am not a monster, but that man has suffered so much that his spirit is completely deformed. Every time he opens his mouth, he harms our cause. Where is he today? For weeks he has been living in the mausoleum of Sheikh Abdul Azim, prowling around the gardens or in the corridors between the buildings, speaking to people about Jamal din's arrest and entreating them to turn against the monarch, telling them of his own suffering, shouting and gesticulating. He never stops avowing that Sayyid Jamal din is the Mahdi, even though he himself has forbidden him to mouth such crazed utterings. I really have no wish to be seen in his company. He is the only person who, who can give me information about the manuscript. I know. I shall take you to him, but I shall not stay with the two of you for a second. That evening, a dinner was held in my honor by Faisal's father, one of the richest men in Tehran. He was a close friend of Jamal din and even though he kept out of any political activity, he was keen to honor the master through me. He had invited almost a hundred people. The conversation centered on Khayyam. Everyone was pouting forth quatrains and anecdotes, and there were animated discussions which sometimes veered off into politics. Everyone seemed perfectly at ease in Persian, Arabic, and French, and most of them could speak some Turkish, Russian, and English. I felt all more ignorant, as they all considered me a great Orientalist, and a specialist in the Rubaiyat, which was a very great, or I would even say an extreme overstatement, but I had to stop contradicting, contradicting it, since my protests were taken as a sign of humility, which, as everyone knows, is the mark of a true intellectual. The evening began at sunset, but my host had insisted that I arrive earlier. He wanted to show me the splendors of his garden. Even if he possessed a palace, as was the case with Faisal's father, a Persian rarely showed people around it. He would neglect it in favor of his garden, his only subject of pride. 
As they arrived, the guests picked up a goblet and went off to find a place near the streams, both natural and man-made, which wound among the poplars. According to whether they preferred to sit on a carpet of a cushion, the servants would rush to place one in the chosen spot, but some perched on a rock or sat on the bare ground. The gardens of Persia do not have lawns, which in American eyes gives them a slightly barren aspect. That night we drank within reason. The more pious stuck to tea, and to that end a gigantic samovar was carried about by three servants, two to hold it and a third to serve the tea. Many people preferred araq, vodka or wine, but I did not observe any misbehavior, the tippiest being happy to hum along with the musicians who had been engaged by the master of the house, a tar player, a virtuoso on the zarb, and a flautist. Later, there were dancers who were mostly young boys. No woman was to be seen during the reception. Dinner was served toward midnight. The whole evening we had been plied with pistachios, almonds, salted seeds, and sweet, mi sweet meats, the dinner being only the final point of the ceremony. The host had the duty to delay it as long as possible, for when the main dish arrived that evening, it was a javahar pilau, a jeweled rice. The guests ate it all up in ten minutes, washed their hands, and went off. Coachmen and lamb bearers clustered around the door as we left to collect their respective masters. At dawn the next day, Faisal accompanied me in a coach to the gate of the sanctuary of Shah Abdul Azim. He went in alone to return with a man who had a disturbing appearance. He was tall but terribly thin with a shaggy beard and his hands trembled incessantly. He was clothed in a long narrow white robe with patches on it and he was carrying a colorless and shapeless bag which contained everything he possessed in the world. In his eyes could be read all the distress of the Orient. When he learned that I came from Jamal al -Din, he fell to his knees and clutched my hand, covering it with kisses. Faisal, ill at ease, stuttered an excuse and went off. I held out the letter from the master to Mirza Reza. He almost snatched it from my hands, and although it comprised several pages, he read it all. He read it all the way through without hurrying, forgetting, forgetting completely that I was there. I waited for him to finish before speaking to him about what interested me, but he spoke to me in a mixture of Persian and French that I had some difficulty in understanding. The book with it, the book is with a soldier who comes from Kirman, which is also my town. He promised to come and see me here the day after tomorrow, on Friday. I will have to give him some money, not to buy the book back, but to thank the man for returning it. Unfortunately, I do not have a single coin. Without hesitating, I took out of my pocket the gold which Jamal al -Din had sent for him, and I added an equal sum of my own. He seemed to be satisfied by that. Come back on Saturday. If God wishes, I will have the manuscript and I will hand it over to you to give to the master in Constantinople.